Our understanding of ourselves has been weaponized against us time and time again. And I'm not purporting to know all the answers, but when I look at it and I think about the, the numbness that we've all faced, the way that we feel so disconnected from who we are and our inability to push past the fears that have been placed in us and have been handed down from generation to generation, from mother to mother, or even father to father, or anybody to anyone, you know, this is how we've arrived here. And I think part of the missing piece of the fight um, is helping others to also understand their own intuition, their own connection with their body. And I do think that harnessing intuition right now is a very unique way to fight fascism. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's gonna break down. It's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik. And I'm Jonathan Cohen. Welcome to our breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. Today, we're gonna break down intuition, yo. We're gonna do it. Jonathan, we're gonna speak to a person who has... um a collection of essays essentially all about what intuition is, how you get it, how you learn it, and what it can do to not only like literally change your life, but possibly change the world. And I believe her. But what's interesting is she's also someone that people probably know about because she's an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actress, director, and writer. I intuitively knew this was going to happen. She's the author of seven critically acclaimed books across genres, including her most recent anthology, which I mentioned, which is called Listening in the Dark, Women Reclaiming the Power of Intuition, which has essays from a bunch of powerhouses, Amy Poehler, Gia Tolentino, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and many more. She also is an opinion writer for The New York Times, The Cut, and The New Yorker. She writes a lot about gender inequality and women's rage. You might be thinking, who is this? Well, she played Emily Quartermain on General Hospital when I was a kid. And it's Amber Tamblin. Amber Tamblin, who she's the like this person that you can know from so many different things, but she's really dedicated her life to... Um, I mean, writing, motivating people. She's a really part of a tremendous movement. She was uh, one of the um, founders of Times Up, which is one of the movements uh, surrounding the Me Too movement. Um, she's a very, very interesting family history. Her her dad is Russ Tamblin, who's um, an actor that that many people um, may know. I, I know him from Twin Peaks, but um, I didn't realize that that was her dad. And um, she's also married to comedian actor David Cross. They they have a daughter, and um, she was a child actress who is just like this incredibly interesting, intelligent woman. She's funny. And uh, this conversation about intuition, I think, is one that really has a lot of potential to connect a lot of threads that we have um, had um, as part of our life and discussion. So i um, very excited. Also, Jonathan, as many of you know, is a practitioner of intuition and is really, really good. He, he's looking very confused right now, but he's a person who often like listens to his gut. I mean, that's literally what what we're talking about here. What does it really mean to listen to your gut and how does it impact the decisions you make and the choices that you make? All right, with that, I will stop making jokes about intuitively feeling things. Let's welcome Amber Tamblin to The Breakdown. Break it down. I'm just gonna say that I watched General Hospital <laughs> when <laughs> I was younger and very excited <laughs> to get to talk to you for many reasons, but um, my mom and I watched um, All My Children, One Life to Live, General Hospital. Uh, I'm, I'm older than you, so it was kind of like in, I think, my blossom years when I would often have like lunch break that was either at one o'clock for One Life to Live or two o'clock, which was General Hospital. So um, I'm 47, and so I think that's about the right timing for when I um, first was introduced to you as an actress. Obviously, you've done many things since then, but I did... I did have to um, just share with you that you've been part of my life for longer than you realized. That's perfect because I think I also grew up watching Blossom. So like we were like deeply entwined without even knowing it. We were. We, we have some other interesting um, kind of intersections as well. You have a, a vast catalog of sort of 
sharing aspects of your life and your experience, both as an actress and then obviously as a writer and, and an activist, if you don't hate that word. I know the rooms you speak of, you know, that you auditioned in because I auditioned in them too. And I wouldn't be surprised if our paths crossed in ways that we may not have even realized. I'm going to start this conversation in an unusual place. You sent a list of kind of suggested reading. And, um, you know, I've, I've read, I have read stuff you've written, um, but I read some very specific excerpts um, from Listening in the Dark. And um, this is your, your new collection of essays. It's available wherever books are sold, in case anyone was curious. I went through your list and like a good student, I read the things. And I guess I thought it might be kind of a fun place to start for you to maybe talk a little bit about what you suggested I read and why. And um, this isn't a quiz, just like I didn't feel like you were quizzing me by saying like, here's some things. But one of the essays, The Science of Intuition and Deep Connection with Nature, um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Nicole Apelian. Of course, exactly not how it looks to my brain. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Nicole Apellian. Um, so you recommended that, which I read. And then this one gives me chills just because the title alone, In the Mouth of the Wolf, You Will Find It on Dreams and Healing Trauma by you. You did all your homework. I did my homework. But there's a lot of Jonathan's voice and heart in what you write and the way you write it. And so I was actually very interested to get to talk the three of us because one of the things that Jonathan and I spend a lot of time on is him trying to convince me, A, that intuition is a real thing, <laughs> B, that there is a scientific and specific connection between our gut and our brain, which I'm the scientist, so I'm the one who is supposed to get on board, and I am, but he knew it intuitively long before it was you know, sort of scientific fodder. And in addition, Jonathan has a very, very elaborate and beautiful dream world. He's also a writer. So talk to us a little bit about In the Mouth of the Wolf. And you can sort of talk about it however you want, but I'm curious sort of what, yeah, what, what was my assignment when you assigned that to me? <laughs> Well, it's so funny that you glean so much meaning from the assignments or the the ones I suggested, because the truth is I just, um, I had to get back to, I think your producers or somebody with an answer. And so I just quickly was like, eh, tell her to read all my essays because there's <laughs> only like four. And then Nicole's because it's great. And it's like science-y. Um, had I known that it was going to be taken like, you know, with it, with this seriousness, there's a few others I would have uh, also recommended, including Dr. Derek Cass, who's an emergency medicine doctor in New York, um, who talks a lot about the power of gestalt and the idea behind how doctors use this sort of second mechanism beside what they have um, besides what they have learned um, from medical school and their their training and you know the the straightforward rational intelligence that you use. Um, in making decisions. And then there is this sort of second part of that that has been ignored, which is the gut, which is the intuitive process, the sort of connection between the brain and the body. Um, but I think that Coles is actually, you know, now that I'm sort of talking to you, I, I also think just like a very wonderful essay because so Nicole, Dr. Nicole Pellian, um, for anyone who has seen the show alone, it's one of my favorite shows. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's um, phenomenal. And it's about sending survivalists out into the wilderness and whoever can last the longest wins. And it is crazy. And it makes me feel like, like such a loser for any time. I'm like, oh, I'm cold. I need a bigger coat. Um, these people are like, I have a fly in my ear and I'm going to die and I don't know how to get it out. Or there's like a <laughs> bear chasing me. Truly, truly. Um, and so Nicole sort of talks about um, how this is such a Western culture problem, right? This disconnect with our body and this disconnect with our intuitive selves, our ability to know something is true without having to have a rational explanation or rational language behind it. And that they're all other cultures, especially tr like tribesmen and Africa and, you know, people who have survived for thousands and thousands of years could not do that without intuition. 
rational thought is really rational intelligence, scientific based thought is really only of the last, you know, several hundred years. It's not something that we have always survived on. And I think that she makes a really beautiful, profound argument for the you know, gut brain connection and all of these things that we're sort of now um, understanding more about the connection between the two. And then obviously I did want you to read the other (laughs) essays that I wrote. One, because I knew there's no way that you and I have not had some of the same experiences with auditioning and, um, you know, being an artist and having this connection with something like the rational brain can memorize lines. But what is this other part of yourself that that brings it off the page. And to to a degree, that's a form of intelligence that you can explain, but it's also not. And we can go deeper into this because there is lots of data behind it. There is uh, lots to be explored. I think I talk about it a little bit and I quote um, Gerd Geigerenzer, who's a philosopher, brilliant philosopher, who who talks a little bit more about this in detail. And, and overall, the book is just here to sort of um, remind us of what oppressive cultures have done to the process of intuitive intelligence and harnessing it and using it in our everyday lives, both for men and for women. I mean, the book is the voices of women, but frankly, I really hope that a lot of men read this book too, and that we can sort of have a larger discussion about what intuition means and how we should be using it, especially right now. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you do great things. But sometimes life gets all of us bogged down. We can feel overwhelmed. We don't show up the way we want to. Working with a therapist can help get you closer to the person that you want to be. And feeling empowered helps you be so prepared to take on everything that life throws at you. Thinking of giving therapy a try? We cannot recommend it enough. And it's time to try better help. Convenient, flexible, affordable. It's all online. You fill out a questionnaire. They match you with a therapist. You can switch at any time. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help get you there. Go to betterhelp.com slash break today. Get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash break. Mind Alex Breakdown is supported by Squarespace. We are supported by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even your time. Squarespace makes it easier for creators and educators to monetize their content and their expertise in a way that fits their brand. So there's these like member areas and you can unlock a new revenue stream for your business, free up time in your schedule by selling access to gated content like classes or online courses or even newsletters. Stand out in any inbox with Squarespace email campaigns. Also, Squarespace has powerful blogging tools to share stories, photos, videos, and updates. You can categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. Display posts from your social profiles on your website, automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that all your followers can share it too. All you have to do is go to squarespace.com slash breakdown for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, what code do they use, Jonathan? Offer code BREAKDOWN to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or a domain. Squarespace.com slash breakdown. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Cozy Earth. You know, going to bed at a decent hour doesn't always guarantee you that you're going to get enough sleep. Because if you are too cold or if you're too hot, if you're uncomfortable, it's going to mess with your sleep. But that can change with Cozy Earth bedding, the softest, most luxurious, and responsibly sourced bedding on the planet. Indeed, I get a good night's sleep when I am perfectly comfortable and having Cozy Earth as the softest, most luxurious and responsibly sourced bedding in the world in my bed makes sleep a pleasure. It's made using the finest premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo. It's naturally temperature regulating. You can use it all year round. Cozy Earth made Oprah's favorite things list five years in a row. They have sheets, they have loungewear, they have pajamas, they have plush bath towels. You will love shopping at Cozy Earth and their bedding comes in five awesome colors and it comes in a really cute canvas bag. Save 35% now on Cozy Earth, but the offer ends soon. Go to CozyEarth.com slash break. Be sure to enter break, B-R-E-A-K at checkout to save 35%. That's CozyEarth.com slash break. My first thought, and it's funny because Dr. Apelian in her essay, and and just to be clear, you know, this is an entire collection of essays of, you know, Amy Poehler wrote what, like there's all these amazing, amazing women who, who wrote pieces, but I especially appreciated hers because, you know, the first thing I think of is like, 
but I don't know what my intuition is. Like, is my intuition like, I want to throw this cup on the floor? Like, is my intuition like something feels shifty about this relationship? I should probably get out. I will say that almost I would I would say that every single time I've felt that since I was started dating, you know, at like 16 or whatever, I was right. And what it was was that like I just didn't listen. Right. But one of the things that she talks about is that this is not something that you just like decide tomorrow to listen to your intuition. Yes, exactly. And I think that's something that like, again, in our like Western you know, thinking it's like, okay, how do I do it? Give me like, what's the fastest way to get to what she has, right? Like, what's the pill? What's the thing? And guess what? It's a, it's a process. And she lays out and I started reading through her list and I was like, I love a list. And it's in bold at the beginning of each paragraph. Like I'm digging it. But the list went on and on because it's not just like, here's the top. I wanted the top five things to do to be like her. You know, I want like the top five things to do to be like you. Like, how do I write it and understand it and live it? And it's like a longer list. We're in a culture of shortcuts, too. I mean, that's really what we are. That's part of the problem. Like, you you know, you look at that list and you're like, Ugh, find a, a sitting place under a tree, like boring, move on. A what spot. else is on the list? <laughs> yeah. But, but those are the things we take for granted that are really you know, a part of this process and thinking about it like a muscle to be flexed. You know, when I um, when I did, uh, when, when the book came out, some of our authors, you mentioned Amy Poehler and Samantha Irby is also one of the um, the contributors. And my mom, who's a school teacher, wrote a really beautiful piece um, amongst many other women. And for one of the launch events, I had the three of them come together and we did a, a virtual event that was very funny and fun. For those who don't know Samantha Irby's work, she's an essayist who is incredibly foul mouthed and super funny <laughs> and writes about like the grossest things about like being a woman with IBS, with diarrhea and like anxiety. And it is she's just fantastic. She's a fantastic fun writer. So you can imagine it was like Amy Poehler, Samantha Irby and my sweet school teacher mother. Um it was a hoot. But uh, so Amy talked a lot about in that interview, she says, you know, if we gave, and I actually have this note up on my wall that says, what do I want to eat? So Amy said, if we gave as much attention to what do I feel or what do I think, not, not what do I know from, you know, uh, the information I've been giving, but what do I, what is the knowledge that I feel about a certain situation, if you're asking yourself this? And if we gave as much attention as we gave to thinking about food all day long to this question, we would be radically different people because we do, we spend all day thinking like we have our breakfast and then we think about what we're going to have for lunch. And then when we're eating lunch, we think about what we're going to have for dinner. And we really don't spend nearly as much time thinking about what might be true for us. And that could be anything, you know, you just talking about all the boyfriends you knew that were like not right for you. And it could be thinking about a partnership or a job that you're living, you know, that you're working at or or anything else that's going on in your life that you might have a question about that you've just not been able to ask yourself. And I thought that that was like a really important point, which speaks to the idea that it's not something you can do overnight. It's not a thing you're just going to discover immediately. Okay. And I think that's the other thing. And I think about it also from the female lens of like, but I love him. My intuition is that we're going to be together forever. Like that's not what you're talking about. And I apologize that that was the voice that I just used to generically <laughs> represent me as a teenager. But <laughs> no, but that's, and like, I don't mean to be a jerk, but like, that's not what we're talking about. Like at all. Yeah. It's not about yeah. like what you think. It's not like what what your culture has basically constructed and raised you to be is what, you know, you then want. Like, I want a really expensive wedding. Like, intuitively, I know that. Like, this is about taking many, 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 many steps back. Tell us your favorite things that we're supposed to do to learn even what our intuition is. So first of all, let's kind of try to define in intuition, which is very hard to do because, and it's meant to be that way. It We don't really have language to describe what it is. What I have sort of described it as is this connection between the physical self, the body, and the mind. It's a connection between what your rational thought can no longer give an answer to, what it, the, the space that it cannot define when you're asking yourself a question or you're trying to make a decision, and the response of the body. But in order to have a response from the body, and that could be like a stomach ache. Some of the women in the books talked about having a tingling in their ear or like a feeling of, of a rock or needing to run or needing to get quiet. 
But in order to get to that place, you need to have a better connection with your body. And this goes back to the conditioning, which women have traditionally had uh, throughout history. And I go through that in one of the essays. I talk a lot about, you know, uh, the othering of women to their own voices dating back to, you know, um, uh, Greek mythology and obviously um, women who were burned at the stakes from the Salem witch, witch trials who heard voices of which we were told were the voices of God, but it was could probably be something else and probably was, um, all the way up to um, the modern advent of psychiatry, which created specific terms like hysteria to describe what is otherwise, you know, a woman's emotions. It's just called a Monday for me. What Freud described is like, that's just Monday. <laughs> Yeah, and it really wasn't until the modern feminist movements of the 1970s and something called the Hearing Voices Movement, which was an actual movement for people who heard, you know, uh, auditory hallucinations or heard voices or were being told being to, to or being compelled to do something, to make a decision, to feel something based on a voice they were hearing, that that was given any kind of respect. So the first thing in defining it is is recognizing that our connection with our bodies has been sort of under this one representation which is that of like anxiety or hatred and we have we have really learned to confuse our intuition for anxiety for what we think might be true for an for an, a response of anxiety in some form or we have just been told the connection with our body is that we need to change it. It's not right. It's too fat. It's too old. It's ugly. It's not the right color. All of the things that we have been told about the relationship to our body has kept us away from this deeper connection to it. So that's the first thing. And once you start to work on that and the listening process of what uh, what your body might tell you in, uh, in an instance where you're trying to be more connected to your intuitive intelligence, then you can push a little bit further. And that's sort of like at the end of the book, um, there is something there that really sort of runs, helps the reader run through um, a process of asking themselves a difficult question and pushing past the initial fear, which is sort of a flight or fight mechanism that kicks in. I don't want to take anything away from anything you've just said. The yes and for me is that uh, male identified human beings have also been totally separated from like, I don't think they're at all taught to, to understand what they feel big time. So when you talk about like understanding how you feel as a precursor to understanding or being connected to emotion, we don't understand how, what we feel at all. We're actually actively taught not to think in terms of feelings. I, I would also argue that I think where women have been conditioned to, to feel less that our feelings, that our emotions are are valueless and actually just get in the way. Men have been conditioned throughout time to lead with them and to lead with forms of their emotions that are, um, you know, in service to masculinity and that there is this real fear about the feminine. There's a real fear about being connected in a more present way to the way that you feel outside of masculine representations. Anger, rage. Yeah, puffing up your chest, needing to be the most powerful, vicious person in the room, you know? And and women sort of take on those forms as well. I mean, I certainly I have, um, and that that is sort of part of the conditioning that we've all experienced. Well, I'm going to ask a dumb question that's also smart. Why is this important? I think this is important because we have to look at where we are and how um, far we have not come. <laughs> and, you know, when we look out at the world right now, we look at our own country. We are looking at a country that is once again, you know, telling women, I'm so sorry, but you actually don't know what's right for your body. We know. We got it. You're like all over the place. You get, I don't know, you like bleed from down there. You're messy. You're upset. Like you have a lot of, let us help. Let us decide. You really should just be taking care of children or you really should just be doing these things that we understand women to do 
and we'll just take the rest. We'll take care of the rest. We'll we'll tell you whether or not you can have free access to uh to healthcare and to birth control pills and whether or not you can have abortions and whether or not that miscarriage is is going to need it, a, an abortion. Um we'll be the ones to decide all of those things. And same thing for um for trans people. The exact same thing the bills you're seeing right now. The, the the unprecedented, horrible bills against trans children and trans adults that is basically telling them you don't know what your body is or what it needs is a part of why this book matters right now and why this conversation, I think, is really important. Because our understanding of ourselves has been weaponized against us time and time again. And I'm not purporting to know all the answers but when I look at it and I think about the the numbness that we've all faced, the way that we feel so disconnected from who we are and our inability to push past the fears that have been placed in us and have been handed down from generation to generation, from mother to mother or even father to father or anybody to anyone, you know, this is how we've arrived here. And I think part of the missing piece of the fight um, is helping others to also understand their own intuition, their own connection with their body, the space that that rationality does not occupy might be really helpful as a tool to fight in this war of the body that we have been experiencing for thousands and thousands of years. And I do think that harnessing intuition right now is a very unique way to fight fascism. And it's part of, it's all part of a larger tool that I think, why not? It's here, it's available to us, you know, and not any, not everyone is like us. You know, we might, the three of us might be sitting here going like, well, I, I kind of know, like when something doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel right. I'm aware, but we have to assume that so many people have no idea what we're talking about. So many women, so many young girls. I mean, I, I think about the therapy bills I would have saved if I had had a book like this when I was a teenager. You know, like I think about that all the time. I think about what a different world, what the patriarchy would look like if young boys, if teenage boys had been made to read a book like this when they were younger. You know, to to have a connection with yourself in a different way that isn't, once again, one of these, you know, foundational answers that's supposed to be the end-all be-all of our connections to each other. I'd like you to talk a little bit about dreams. Because in many cultures, dreams are seen essentially as an extension of non-dream states. Um, and, you know, we we know a, a certain a, and, and a significant amount about the, the quote, like purpose of dreams or um, kind of the playground that is the mind. And um, I have a very interesting relationship with dreams, as does Jonathan. I often have very, very active dreams where I'm like uh, uh. translating things into languages that I speak that are not my native tongue. Wow. I have never heard that before. It is not restful sleep. I'll be honest. Like I've composed music in my sleep. I've written poetry in my sleep. And like, that's not restful. Like it's not, I, I'm not like, Ooh, I'm so special. Like to me, that's not, um, it's not a healthy way to get rest, but for me, dreams are like a very, I see them as a very direct extension of what I do in my waking life because they're often very similar. And of course I have like dreams that don't quote make sense, meaning I have fantastical dreams. Um, you talk a lot about the image of a wolf. For me, it's a whale, a blue whale in particular. Oh, but... It's just been like, like a recurring thing. Um, but I'm curious for you to talk a little bit about in, you know, it kind of seems like with everything that you write about, there's a tremendous amount of like research that goes on, yes, um, you know, yes. either either literally or emotionally. And so can you talk a little bit about uh, dreams in general, meaning like what they can teach us about intuition? Because Jonathan is always like, help me, like, we're going to talk about this dream that I had because it means, you know, something. And I do believe in dream analysis. It's something my therapist, we've worked on dreams for many, many years, but you talk about it in a really, really different and specific way. So I want you to speak in particular about dreams, how you relate those to intuition. And then I'd like you to share a little bit about the wolf. <laughs> hmm. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorite essays the, in the book that I wrote. Um, it's called In the Mouth of the Wolf, You Will Find It. 
And the essay looks at my um, obsession with keeping record of my life when I was a child. I have hundreds and hundreds of journals. I'm actually like, currently I have this one that I'm trying to remember the code to. Oh, um, I have some, I literally, we. I have a journal collection also, and there are some that just cannot be opened, and, and I've I, broken I them. I could totally break it, but I don't yep. want to. So I've just, just been break sitting it here open. at my desk. I want desk. to know what's in there. I've just been sitting here at my desk, just sort of like going through them. Where's the other, I have like some other little very funny things here. But anyway, I have a lot of fucking journals um, <laughs> dating back to, to young childhood. And um, it was almost like, and I don't know if this is just like the, the was the child actor trauma in me too, that it was like I had to have some record, um, some like artifact, some some archive of my real life as 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 it pertained to me and having a career that was sort of constantly suspended in in disbelief and in which you're constantly playing characters for a living. Um, there was this other part of me that needed to sort of have a have a record of my of my real life. Um, so I just I wrote down everything and I I used to have really wild, vivid dreams. I don't so much anymore since having my daughter, but one of the things, one of the recurring themes in my journals and in my dreams was a wolf and was different forms of wolves. They would show up in different ways. But um, years ago, and this is what the essay is about, when I was sort of looking through and going through my old journals and doing a lot of therapy and sort of looking at my childhood, um, there was a reoccurring dream that happened over and over in this in this very similar way um, where a wolf is, I'm in the bedroom sleeping under covers and a, wolves are coming in and there's someone there and they're attacking someone in the living room and it's, you know, it was a very specific thing. And um, every time I was reading them and I would started to mark them and I'm like, why is this recurring? And I also just had this like pit in my stomach. Like something, something about this dream is telling me something. And this is part of the intuition process, right? It's like, you know, I feel the same way about astrology and like the idea of like astrological signs and stuff, which I think are absolute bullshit. But do I think that there is something true about the stars and the planets all being aligned during the specific time in which I was born that maybe another person was also born at that exact moment? Sure. I'm not going to pretend to like know the answer to that. But I find that to be fascinating. And so I think dreams, you can glean meaning from that as well. And that's part of who we are as human beings. We're not robots. We are storytellers. We are um, master mythologizers. This has been our practice since the beginning of time, is to find meaning and to find story from, from who we are. And so as I looked into it, basically the, the short version of it is that it brought me back to a time in which something traumatic happened with a babysitter who was babysitting me and came in in the middle of the night um, in that exact room in that exact same way. And so my sort of obsession with wolves that I had all the way up through my teenagehood was was also, was also almost like guiding me towards this specific point of trauma in my childhood. And the essay sort of tracks that and looks at it um, as something that was leading me much in the way that um, that my intuition was. Do you know what a wolf, like, why a wolf? I think because, you know, the wilderness of the subconscious mind is so vast and so unexplored um, and can be so scary. And a wolf feels to me, my guess, my, my, my feeling on it is that wolves to me feel like the epitome of that wildness. Hmm. Um, and so they're sort of representative to the wilderness within me, the part of me that feels that is not in control, the the part of me that um, might know something deeper that that my conscious mind is not ready to process, mm -hmm. which very much is a is a is a real thing for um for in, for an in, intuitive connection and being able to know when you're ready to process something with the conscious mind. So the wolf to me sort of symbolizes, and I think did throughout my childhood, that other part of me that felt um, that felt more wild and free. And certainly, you know, being a child actor, you have schedules. I went to school, and then after school, I went to work. Then I went to bed. I mean, they, everything was so regimented. Your life is not your life. Your life belongs to Hollywood. Your life belongs to this like 
career that you didn't really choose for yourself, that your parents chose for you. And then you spend all of that time pleasing adults and trying to get them to love you through doing this craft, um, which to me feels totally antithetical and totally opposite to what the wolf energy is and to how it would represent itself in my dreams, which was always like not fully, there was never violence against me, but there was always chaos. There was always a sense that like I was going into the woods. I was going into an unknown place where things were not controlled and where I could be this like feral animal and tell everyone how I really felt. And that's sort of how it was represented in my dreams. Mind Be Alex Breakdown is supported by Third Love. What if there was a bra that made you look and feel amazing? I'm not asking you, Jonathan. I'm asking all of our friends out there. What if there was a bra that makes you feel, look, and feel amazing and is actually super comfortable all day? Well, I'll be honest. Most bras don't do that because they suck and it's a real bummer. But Third Love knows it's not you. It's the bra. Third Love spent years designing bras for your body. They have over 60 sizes and even invented half cups. Amazing. So you always get the perfect fit, which means you will always look and feel really great. I had a history of not being able to find a bra that fit me. And everybody was like, go to this place, go to this place, get that. Nothing worked until my third love bra. I love my everyday bra, but third love's got it all. You want something with more coverage, unlined, little extra lift, all the above. Their best-selling bras are designed to fit and support your body. Not only do they have a style for every solution and outfit that will make you look and feel great, they're also available in those half cup sizes, and it really makes a difference. Ditch bad bras. Get a better one that makes you look and feel great. Upgrade your bra, get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. That's 20% off your first order today at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. Mind Be Alex Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. You've been stewing about a health problem you have. You almost resort to texting your group chat to get all your friends' opinions. And while you're extremely unlikely to find quality medical advice in that group, you can find it from a doctor on ZocDoc. Thousands of medical professionals on ZocDoc are there to help you. They listen like a friend and give you the expert care you need. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. Plus, the doctors on ZocDoc treat almost every condition under the sun. No more Dr. Roulette or scouring the internet for questionable reviews. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor that you haven't even met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who's patient-reviewed and fits their needs and schedule just right. Go to ZocDoc.com breakdown. Download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash breakdown, ZocDoc dot com slash breakdown. The reason that I'm sort of like picking at this is because you're the notion kind of throughout these essays and throughout this book and really throughout this sort of I mean, it's a movement. You're you're literally like starting a movement of, you know, a kind of awareness. And the notion is not just like oh, we've been disconnected from ourselves, right? Meaning like we sometimes, like it's true. I don't even know, like that gut feeling I usually assume is it's anxiety or I don't know what to say or I should shut up or, you know, like whatever, just because that's just our existence. But there's also a distance from a larger communal understanding of what do we need or want as a society? How do we want to treat women? How do we want to treat men? But then this other notion also of what if our intuition is also this ancient thing? There's this connectedness with something even bigger, right? And and that is, you know, it sounds, it's, it's not new agey to say that that has a connection in nature because as you said, for thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, we've been working towards this point, but this is not the end point. The end point may have actually been some intuition from many thousands of years ago that we sort of kept working through. But that that notion that nature is this very important component of teaching. Is there other places that you've kind of found that or that it weaves its way through some of these other essays that really the role of nature in kind of getting back in touch with your intuition? Yeah, my mom, my mom writes about it. Uh, my mom has lived many lives beyond being a school teacher. Um, but she really talks about um, how hard she's been on herself. Um over the years and how unsure um, on second guessing herself she's been about certain decisions in her life that have led to things like, um, 
you know, uh, loss of um, of family heirlooms that dated back seven generations, you know, to the Civil War and um, and all kinds of different things. She opens her essay with um, she lived up in June Lake in Northern California when she was younger and um, seeing a fire up in the mountains and having, you know, which they do to sort of help clear brush. They do these controlled fires um, or they used to rather. Um, but uh, having a feeling about this particular fire and making her friend drive up the side of a mountain where there was no road. Um, and sure enough, they found this guy in his car with his face all bashed up and he had, there'd been an explosion. Um, you know, there, it, it's it's fascinating. And that was a good time when she did follow it, when it was led to something. But there were other times when she really sort of, you know, ignored it or followed it and then found it to not be part of, you know, what her intuition was telling her. But I think that's also part of it, right? Is that like sometimes it is anxiety and, you know, sometimes it is intuition and sometimes they do really get confused. I always like to say, you know, that, um, you know, intuition has a more exciting feeling to it. It feels less dreadful. Um, when you're thinking about something with anxiety, there's, you know, you feel sort of not good. Um, and there's a sense of doom, of impending doom. Whereas, you know, intuition, you know, even if you're asking yourself the scariest question in the world, like something that would just upend your entire life, there's still a spark behind it. There's a There's a kind of excitement or a joy or a sense of a, um, of a door opening to something. Um, maybe there's a wolf on the other side. Uh, so I would say my mom's essay in there is really interesting and talks about nature. There's, there's, um, there's several of them in there. And also Ada Lamone, who is our U.S. Poet Laureate. Um, interestingly enough, I had already written my essay about dreams and the wolf experience. And her, she, when she turned in her essay to me for the first round of edits, she also talked about dreams and talked about the creative connection um, between dreams and writing. Um, and she writes about her relationship with wolves. So we wow. were both like having this simultaneous conversation in two different essays about our connection to our dream life and what that meant for our waking world, for, for the waking worlds around us. I think there's a really interesting split between am I afraid of something and it's guiding me not to do it versus as, am I drawn to it? So when you were speaking about the difference between intuition having a spark, I think a lot of people, because they have no past relationship with how to navigate emotion, emotion is just seen as this thing that overwhelms us. How do we begin to identify what am I being guided towards and how do I sort out the difference between those two things? I appreciate that distinction. Um, I've shared on the pod before about uh, I've had a recurring dream and that I didn't even realize I had a recurring dream until it was like eight years later and I found myself in the place that I had been shown in that dream. Um, wow. And it yes. was like, wow. It totally blew me away because I hadn't had it for many, many years. And then when I got to this town that I'm in now and I walked downtown and it was a very distinct environment um, with like a river running beside it and a tree and a bridge and like the formation of a downtown which was just a little square it's not easily uh, replicated so it was very unique and I got there at a particular time in my life and I was just like all of a sudden brought back to this recurring dream that I had had many many years before before my son was born and when that hit me i was like what was i being shown in that time period how was i was it a prophecy what part of me knew that i would be there at some time and would need that message to slow me down to give me context that like where i was on my journey of life because I had arrived at that town almost by accident, like that I was supposed to be there. And it was, it, it for me provided the sense that like everything is going to be okay. It was a reassuring quality. You know, someone that we've spoken to had said that you are every person in your dream. So like when you're dreaming about someone else, it's actually really a representation of you. And I wonder how the wolf plays into that, whether or not there are actual symbol symbols or external guides in our dream or really are these just aspects of ourselves and we all have all these different aspects of ourselves that then are externally represented to us mostly i think that's because every time i would dream about babies my therapist was like god please don't have another child it's just a <laughs> it's just a part of you it's you're gonna birth a new part of yourself <laughs> that's hilarious 
Um, well, first of all, I think that there is, I mean, there is real scientific data behind, you know, psychic capabilities. Um, not the kind that when we go to, you know, uh, get the tarot read, which is also, I think, a fine thing. It's part of our mythology. I wouldn't, you know, take that as anything other than that. Um, but some of that can be found, not to like promote another book, but this thing called The Sense of Being Stared At. And Jonathan, I think you should read this. This is a really brilliant book, and it talks a lot about case studies in which they have found that people had premonitions about um, things exactly in this nature. It's absolutely fascinating. And there's this book is quoted a lot in, in Listening in the Dark in my own book. Um, but as far as, you know, the wolf and what it represents – as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think, I think for me, I touched a little bit on that of just that it is, uh, you know, it was a protector. It was a way for me to have something that felt like it was protecting me, that it was vicious and wild and, and scary to others. Um, because I grew up in an environment that sort of sometimes felt like the opposite of that, where there was a lot of predatory behavior in an industry that treats girls and women um, as such, as objects. Um, and so I think my guess is as, as my, you know, conscious mind was forming, a lot of this idea about like a wolf being a protector and being something that was there to guide and show me was probably what, that's probably what it, the the symbology behind it meant for me. I don't think I was necessarily seeing myself as one, though maybe at times, because I also, as I said, wanted to feel free and feral and wild and and um, not feel so restrained um, with like a full career at 10 years old. Um, so I think that those were sort of two of the aspects of what the wolf um, was trying to represent itself as in, in my dreams and in my writing. I mean, I really wanted to tell you all the things I learned from all the other essays that you told me to read. Um, but I, uh, I'll put that aside. You know, there's so much to this, um, to this book and these essays that, you know, they're each also such important, different takes on this topic. This really feels like you've taken a, a very large concept um, that is also really, really specific. And it's just really, really beautifully, you know, kind of assembled all these different um, opinions, but something strikes me that um, I want to touch on with you, and it's sort of um, a, a series of questions or kind of thoughts um, that that I've been asked a lot and that I ponder a lot, and I'm curious what your response is because I think you're likely um, more uh, fearless than I am, um, or I, I I think I'm less I think I'm more fearful than you. Um, so there's something about, you know, um, the just the way you speak, the way you articulate things, the way you compose yourself that I find very just like attractive, meaning like to to hold space with you, to listen to you like I could listen to you all day. And I'm sure that there are ways that I can do that if I'd like to spend more time on the Internet. It can it can be arranged. <laughs> right. We'll figure it out. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about, and I'm curious about it both because you've had such an interesting and, and prominent, you know, career and then, you know, found your way in a different aspect of, you know, representing yourself. I'm asking sort of, you know, for your perspective with everything you've been through, the experiences you've shared, um, the trauma you've experienced, the objectification, uh, you know, what what is it that sort of... Um, do you see yourself as, as a voice? There's a really great and funny uh, piece in the last book that I wrote, Era of Ignition, Coming of Age um, in a Time of Rage and Revolution, which is sort of part memoir, um, part also looking at all of these pieces of conversation we've been having. But there is like a very funny list. I can't remember the name of it that I, um, uh, it's something like requirements to become uh to become president of the United States if you're a woman. And it goes through <laughs> like a 10-page list. It becomes like aggressively insane with like sublists, subcategories, down to the craziest things of like the the octave of your voice must be between these two, oh, yeah. you know, decibels and um and then but then it it spirals and spirals out into the into the insanity of like you must have all the degrees and none of the degrees. You must have like gone to the Air Force and also had 57 children. You must have like the the impossible 
litmus test, the, like the, the impossible purity test of perfection that we put women through to do anything or to be valued or to be taken seriously is kind of fucking funny. I mean, it's like so, it is so out of hand. Um, and we can look at that. I mean, my my favorite thing to always, my favorite discourse, um, besides like arguing with one, uh, men about women in politics, um, which is just like my fucking favorite thing in the whole world. I will just <laughs> beat someone into submission with my mouth about why women matter in politics, but also like the things that women are put through. And I'm, obviously Hillary Clinton's the easy one, but when we look at um, you know, women of color, or we look at Elizabeth Warren, um, Kamala Harris to a degree, you know, it is uh, it is pretty profound the ways in which we um, are completely terrified of any women who are vying for a position of power that we don't think they deserve, because that's traditionally how it's been seen. Um, so, you know, I think for me, it's just interesting. And I also probably like you, exactly like you, like grew up in a business where, you know, Pre Me Too movement, pre the, the 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 big cultural shift that we've had in the industry, which is still not enough, but it's something in which we want women directors, we want more women behind the camera, we want more women, and you know, to be making decisions. You know, I grew up mastering the art of coming up with a good idea and making it feel like it was a man's, whether that man was a show creator, a film director, a writer. Um, I got very, very good at doing that. And so it's an old, it was an old skill for me to sort of know how to um, make the men who were in positions of power around me feel good about themselves and feel like I wasn't trying to be too smart or too in the way of what they were doing, um, which I think is something that like lots of women in our business can relate to. I think lots of women in general. Yeah, true, true. I'm hearing more and more women, like, just, like, even at the supermarket, like, can't, like, figure out a conversation with, like, the dude behind the counter that doesn't make him feel small if it's, like, about an artichoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think in, in any industry, um, which is also why the Me Too movement resonated in such a huge way, because it was, you know, talk about a, a collective awakening of 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 intuition, of, of a sense in our gut that something was wrong and we weren't going to be quiet about it anymore. That is sort of like one of the most powerful ones, I think, in modern history that we can point to. It's a joy to be in a space of uh, discomfort when we're talking about things that are difficult, um, when they're difficult to name, when they're difficult to identify. Um, and I'm interested in that. I'm interested in knowing what is harder to explain or what is harder to express to someone um, than what might be easier. That also could frankly come from my background as a poet because poetry is like the most impossible thing. And Victoria Chang once called it the armpit of the literary world. And I think that's true, how it's perceived. Um, it's very difficult to understand and to write and to just sort of be a part of. And so I, I, I lean towards those things and I enjoy... Um, trying to find which part of a conversation, you know, when I think about women's rage, when I think about women's inequality, all of these things that we've read many books about in the last several years, you know, what is the underpinning of that? What is the piece of the puzzle that we haven't really touched? What is the thing that we think is a cliche or that we, you know, we think is something we understand and know um, so we don't need to touch it again? But a topic like this to me is um, is pretty pretty fresh and new and and is ready to be um, to be explored and to be looked at by women of of all generations. I've also been on the journey of like the hormone you know party um, that you know honestly if someone had told me you know when I was I don't know thirteen like at my bat mitzvah like here's the story. <laughs> <laughs> and if they had actually <laughs> told me like what your body is going to go through and like the number of also like emotional and thyroid and autoimmune connections that are going to oh, be made oh. that like no yeah. one had done research on, I'd be like, I'm sorry, what's the world you're sending me into? What do you mean? No one's oh, done yeah. research. So I've just yeah. been on this, you know, kind of, um, I mean, I'm 47, but I had my first hot flash, I think at, 
I was very young. I was maybe 40. Um, and I've just been Me on too. like. I'm, I'm perimenopausal. I'm 39 and I'm Mazel perimenopausal. Tov. Yeah. And I'm every, everybody, including my own husband was like, aren't you too young? And yeah. I'm like, I get that too. No, I mean, this is normal. We just never talk about well, it. The, look, there's a, there's a range of normal. And I remember I, I, um, I tend to, I, I tend to not use like traditional, um, you know, uh, obstetric care. I'm a home birth, yeah. you know, crazy person. Um, meaning I'm crazy about the home birth movement and I'm, you know, I see a midwife instead of a quote regular obstetrician, just because I prefer the care of midwifery. Even if you don't, this is something I always like to remind our female viewers, even if you don't have children, don't want children, midwives are, um, typically certified nurses and you can actually go to them for well women care, even if you don't plan on having kids or whatever. Anyway, and it's just a different That's kind amazing. of, yeah, it's a different kind of okay. care. Anyway, I remember when I first went to my midwife about this, she's like, Oh, that's because there's a 10 year process. You're just, I'm like, there's a who, what? Yeah, there's a 10 year process that your body's gonna, oh, 10 years? Like, there's not, I wasn't even married for 10 years. Like, that's a long haul to do anything with my body. Um, in any event, um, one of the things that, you know, it's been shocking to discover is the kind of lack of information specifically about the links between women's mental health and our hormonal status and also autoimmune conditions and specifically thyroid. I have, oh, an, yes. yeah, I have an overactive thyroid. I'm like the, the weirder one just cause I always have to be special. Um, but you know, for many women, uh, having an underactive thyroid or Hashimoto's or like these kind of things are so often in conjunction with many aspects of this. So I also just wanted to give you like a special shout out. Um, and if you ever want to privately talk about any of these things, I would love to. Um, but I, I just had one more question. Um, are, are you like a, a natural birth, listen to your body intuition kind of person? Or did you feel a different kind of intuition around parenting? I'm, I'm curious if there was overlap for you, you know, in, in that aspect of your life. That's such a great question. Um, I had a C-section. Mm -hmm. Um and which is also uh, sometimes a very intuitive and necessary thing. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll talk about the intuition of my of my doctor who mm. was, you know, I mean, I think it was coupled, obviously, with just experience and the knowledge of doing what she does. But mm -hmm. um, but my daughter was not dropping. She was mm. she was something was off about the way I was holding her in my body. And so she's like, I think we need to schedule a C-section. And I was very, you know, um, you know, wary of of everything I had been told and read and heard about, which I know that's a very real thing. It's like right. easier for doctors. Hospitals make more money um, by just doing a scheduled C-section. Um, and I really wanted the experience of, of a natural birth. Um, but uh, she was like, I really think something is, is off. And it's, we were at the marker. It was like time to give birth, even though you know that that usually can take longer um, with a first child. Um, long story short, I did it. And sure enough, I had, the shortest umbilical cord she had ever seen. So much so, Whoa. she asked me if she could talk about it <laughs> in some case study stuff with some other doctors and bring it up at this lecture she was going you, to. You literally had a baby who didn't want to leave your womb. <laughs> didn't want to leave me and like was shut, was like held up by this like impossibly tiny umbilical cord. And no doubt I would have been in an emergency C-section. Anyway, right. So like talk about intuition, intuition. And she couldn't figure out what it was. You know, she was like, you know, went through all the different reasons why this was happening. Amazing. Um, why the lining wasn't thinning, like everything that was going on. But like that was her intuition where all other, you know, um, forms of decision making that you would run through right. a checklist as a doctor – like something else was failing her. She's like, okay, now I need to like lean on this other part of my you, of my head. You so. have a child with the shortest leash ever. <laughs> the shortest <laughs> leash ever. Exactly. It's perfect. What a metaphor. It's been really a pleasure uh, talking to you. And we, we really, we appreciate um, just all of your wisdom and your humor. And it's just been really um, wonderful to have our paths cross this way. Oh, it's a, a true joy. Thank you for having me. We didn't get to cover this idea of re redefining or clarifying the term psychic. I think it has a lot of negative connotations because of the types of yeah. scams, charlatans, connecting with other worldly creatures, seances. I'm going to help you communicate with the dead. But the way that she was describing it was much more about intuition and that we have another ability 
outside of what our actual senses are. And we've actually touched on this a, a few times in the podcast. With Bev. Once with Bev, we have. Uh, I tried to articulate something extrasensory in the Jackson Galaxy podcast, which I actually revisited that clip and it didn't come out quite as clear as I had hoped. He had asked, you know, about anxiety and what if the anxiety is not just the anxiety itself? What it's what if it's telling you something, but you don't have the language to understand what it's telling you? That sounds like a great episode. What podcast is that? I don't, it's our podcast, but oh, I don't know what oh, number Oh, I is. should listen to that. <laughs> um, well, one thing that I think maybe you could shed a little light on, because I feel like this is something where, you know, sort of no nomenclature can can betray us, you know, like what we call something and the semantics of it. But um, if instead of psychic ability. People can even discredit intuitive ability or intuitive senses they're like oh that's just you justifying something that you can't explain with a feeling well a lot of times what i get annoyed with you about is because you are you are and i this is me being completely sincere because you do have a very strong intuitive sense and in in many many and very Im many important ways you are uh, correct about your intuition and about your intuitive sense you sometimes get paralyzed when you don't feel a strong intuition about something. I know what you're talking about. It's like, oh, if I don't feel guided towards something in a strong way, if it's just sort of neutral, it does. I, I am like, oh, what should I do here? And I will say that I have had strong intuition um, and it's been inaccurate. It's It's not that we can only go by intuition. So for example, and I don't know what this was, there was someone that we were talking to and I had this like sense of like, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know what it's going to be like. And it actually turned out to be awesome. And so not all sensing is the same. Okay. So, so for me, like when, and, and I'm, you know, I'm going to lean into this heavily because I, I, I do feel like I've, I've come by this self-awareness, you know, honestly, most of my intuition just feels like fear. <laughs> I'm just afraid. Well, like, I'll be like, like, I'll be afraid to act. I'll be, I mean, to act on something. I'll be afraid to say something. I'll be afraid to do something. I'll be afraid to try something new. I'll be afraid to to, to say yes to something that, that I don't know if I'm going to do well. And so what I get to hide or what we get to hide behind is like, well, I just know that's not for me. I just intuitively know that's not for me, you know? And what that is, is that's actually fear. That's not intuition. But it was very interesting that she pointed out that a lot of times what we perceive as anxiety is actually intuition. So the notion is not just like, how do you become more in touch with your intuition? The notion is, how do I learn to distinguish the emotions that underlie actions that I want to take or don't want to take and be able to authentically say, this is me and this is not me? That is right. From our breakdown to the one, <laughs> I mean, that's all you have to say. That is right. I very rarely say that is right to you. I thought you'd be more excited. <laughs> oh, I felt kind of unceremonious. I usually, I usually say that's not quite it. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. You've somewhat miscategorized me. I figured. I figured it out. That's it. I figured that out. No, but do, do you know what I'm saying? That like, it's kind of like it's a my... huge process, right? To separate those things out yeah what am i feeling in this moment as a reaction right versus how do i feel in general two separate things mm -hmm. the moment is acute it changes it settles it shifts as time goes on as i get used to an idea or someone gets used to an idea as new information is brought forth so that's like the immediate that's the reaction how I feel about things in general is I have more information, I can see a bigger picture, or our intuition is guiding us that even without logical explanation, there's something about a situation, a person, an experience that I'm being pushed towards. Those are two separate feelings, but they're both feelings. And how do you separate them to understand them? Maybe the thing is not simply saying like, I'd like to understand intuition better, or I'd like to be more into maybe even before that, it's m being able to move away from your fear, meaning not to identify with your fear so much so that it interferes with your ability to even know what your intuition is. 
and move away from our anxiety so that we're able to say this anxiety is about something that's not this or this anxiety is actually not anxiety. It's that gut feeling of don't walk alone on this street. And I can't tell you, especially as a woman, how many times we as women and yes, men too, but how many times as a woman we make calculations that we are hoping will be the right calculation. And like it catches in my throat and my heart because I know many, many women and I don't know that there's a person who doesn't know a woman who has thought I shouldn't go there or I shouldn't be there. I shouldn't, I've been that person. I shouldn't have this one more drink, you know? I shouldn't stay. These are the calculations that we are as humans making all the time. But it's so much fear also about what will people say. I can't tell you how many times I'm a pretty like, I mean, I'm not like a straight edge person, but like my life's pretty not exciting, right? I mean, it hasn't been very exciting. There was some years that were like a little exciting. But even in those few years, like the calculations you make, right? What part of me wasn't ready to say leave, right? You should don't let somebody talk to you like that. Leave. It's it's fear of what other people will think. I mean, I can tell you as a woman, like that's that's programming. That's just pro I'm just like programmed. I mean, I think I'm programmed both as a woman and I think also just, you know, with my particular whatever, my my family. And yeah, for me, a lot of just like fear of what will people think instead of I know that I should go home. Like, I, I know that I should. And I envy, you know, I, I envy when I see men behaving in ways that are like, oh, my God, they just like totally weren't having a good time and they just left. <laughs> like, wasn't even a thing. I once had a situation with someone. It was a date situation where, like, he had absolutely no problem being like, this doesn't feel right. Bye. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. We're in the middle of, like, a, a negotiation of, like, a relationship. Like, what? And I never do that, you know? I know I have like we're supposed to spend the next four hours both wishing we should leave <laughs> and then plotting let's go our to therapy. exit inching ourselves off the chair getting your foot ready to make a move but not making that move until we're both sweating and anxious and exhausted and then awkwardly hug and say maybe we'll text again another and, time and that's how we started this podcast <laughs> <laughs> from our breakdown to the one we intuitively hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down.